Hello and welcome to this ONDR module video. This is video 208 in our series of XK videos. In this video we're going to take a look at this brochure celebrating 60 years of the XK brand. So it gives you all the heritage right up to the XK and beyond to the aluminium body car. Um, it's some, some lovely graphics and quite interesting information in here. So please join us in a read through. 1948 to 2008 XK 60 years of legendary performance. Table of contents, page 5, birth of the XK, page 11, C type and D type, page 15, enter the E type, page 21, XK, the modern era. XK, a heritage of legendary for performance. Since 1948, the XK name has graced a generation of iconic Jaguars. From the original to the current, they epitomise Jaguar's philosophy to create beautiful, fast cars. In March 1945, William Lyons, the founder of the Swallow Sidecar Company, decided it was time for his company to have a new name. He chose to call it Jaguar, a name that had been used as a model batched by SS cars some ten years earlier. A new insignia for his mark was more than just an early exercise in rebranding. However, for in post-war Britain, the name represented a perfect opportunity for Lyons to unveil a new plan, a new beginning, in fact, for the company, as it sought to adapt and grow. Birth of the XK Lyons knew that to appeal to an expanding overseas markets, he had to move Jaguar forward and that included replacing his ageing engines with something more appropriate to the Mark's sporting character and aspirations. That sporting aspiration would be the catalyst for Jaguar's future, a physical evidence of it came in a new engine, the one that would be far more modern and hugely more sophisticated than the SS car's outdated predecessors. By 1948, the brilliant twin-overhead camshaft six-under engine will be ready for production. They called it the XK. 1948-1961 XK 120, 140 and 150 Although the XK engine reached production in 1948, it had been conceived during the war years by a core team of brilliantly talented engineers led by William Lyons himself. There were names that would be integral to Jaguar's history and included Chief Engineer Bill Haynes, Chief Designer Claude Bailey and Chief Experimental Engineer Walter Hassan. While supporting the war effort, they found time to plan ahead for the cars they hoped to build once hostilities had ended. Ever-resourceful Lions found a way for them to do it, arranging for a group to be on the same weekly overnight firewatch shift at Brown's Lane factory. So every Sunday night they could keep one eye on the war and spend hours talking about future cars and engines that would power them. Their thoughts ranged across V8s, V12s and inline engines. Haynes analysed virtually every engine in production at that time, from the standards they had used for the SS models to those produced by Bentley, Vauxhall and even the 1175cc four-cylinder BMW engine, which impressed him a lot. And while Haynes did his homework, Lyons laid down the targets for Jaguar's own engine. It, it must have, he agreed, around 160 bhp with flexible performance and good refinement, all as a basis for a 100 mile per hour saloon. Reasoning that fuel might be rationed after the war, and big engines more heavily taxed. Lyons aimed to achieve the power increase from the 125 bhp standard based engines through efficiency, not just size. So planning a capacity of no more than 2.5 litres for six cylinders, his team had to find a way of improving output dramatically from around 36 bhp to 64 bhp per litre. Sophisticated solutions such as hemispherical combustion chambers and large inclined valves in an aluminium head allowed highly efficient breathing 
but also demanding a highly complex twin overhead cam layout, something that was typical of Grand Prix cars, rare even on exotic sports cars, and simply unheard of in mass production. Lion, though, never hesitated. Once the war had ended, with the factory having escaped the Blitz, where much around it was flattened, car production resumed, and the group's plans for the new X-Series engines began to move swiftly from concept stage to development. The X stood for experimental. XA was the first draft of the four-cylinder XF. That was the first run. And a couple more iterations, they arrived at the XK, a longer-stroke version of the stillborn six-cylinder XJ. Further refined, an early 146 bhp 2-litre four-cylinder XK engine made a spectacular debut in September 1948, achieving 176 mile per hour on the new Jabecki motorway in Belgium in Goldie Gardner's streamlined record breaker. But while the four-cylinder engine never reached production, the first of a definitive sixes made an equally dramatic debut in October 1948 when Jaguar's new XK120 sports car stole the first post-war, post-war motor show at Earl's Court in London. The number hinted at its top speed in May 1949. It more than proved that the claim, hitting 133 miles per hour in streamlined formed a Jabaki and over 120 miles an hour in production trim with a note to 60 of less than 10 seconds. At a stroke, it put Jaguar in the realms of super sports cars and the XK120 on the road to immortality for both its looks and legendary performance. The XK6 began life at 3,442cc and having proved itself in low volume, the XK120, it was rushed into full production for the Mark 7 saloon which appeared in 1950. Powerful, flexible, durable and refined, the engine was so perfectly designed from the start that the basics would change very little over its life, which would have run into several decades. But the XK never stood still for a moment. It kept getting better in each successive version. In 1954, the special equipment 3.4 litre offered 190 bhp, in the new XK140, which was more civilised successor to the XK120, and 110 bhp achieved in a hugely successful race-bred C-type was eventually matched by an early version of the X of the 3.4 litre. A short stroke 112 bhp 2.4 litre saloon was also introduced for Jaguar's first unit construction saloon in 1955. In the other direction, a 3.8 litre version appeared in October 1958 in the Mark IX Jaguar's first brake disc version. Then from 1959 in the iconic Mark II, and also in 1959 the 3.8 litre XK6 appeared in the glorious XK150. It was quite simply one of the finest engines in the world. XK120, the racer's favourite. XK power made Jaguar sports cars ideal for competition cars through the 1950s, both on the track and in rallying. rallying. The first 140 XK120s had handmade aluminium bodies before the steel production body was created and the 125 mile an hour plus speed trial car had won the XK120's first ever race at Silverstone in 1949. Sterling Moss's XK120 won the 1950 Tourist Trophy on the demanding road course at Dunroyd, and one of the, the aluminium cars took fourth place in the XK120's first, first Le Mans, laying the foundation for Jaguar's first Le Mans winner, the C-Type. Phil Hill gave the XK120 its first American win in 1950 and in the same year the XK started to take rallying by storm too. Tony Clays won the 1950 Liège-Roma-Liège rally. XK120 won the Acropolis rally and the Tour de France 
and Ian Appleyard's string of successes in the famous Nub 120 soon included two RC rallies plus four Alpine Cups. XK on the podium from the racing C-type. From the day the XK engine broke cover in Goldie Gardner's streamlined speed trial car in 1948, it was clear that the cars it powered would be ideally suited to bringing Jaguar success on the racetrack. And the track in which William Lyons would seek his greater challenge, greatest challenge was the Le Mans. As early as 1950, a privately run XK120 had finished 12th in the great 24-hour race and Lyons decided to tackle the event with a works team in 1951. The specially adapted XK120C, or C-type as it soon to became known, was as fast as it was beautiful, winning Le Mans as its first attempt and again in 1953, when the car is now benefiting from advanced Weber carburetors and innovative brake discs would finish it in 1st, 2nd and 4th place. By now Jaguar had a fully-fledged competition department run under the watchful gaze of manager Lofty England who sought to evolve its race cars and in 1954 the factory had another surprise up its sleeve. To the stunning D-Type, designed by the brilliant aerodynamicist Malcolm Sayer, the D-Type was a remarkable race car, a combination of design efficiency and striking beauty. Highly advanced for its day, the, har- the car had a stressed monocoque chassis, rather like an aircraft's fuselage. Sayer had worked in aviation before joining Jaguar. Its streamlined body allowed it to hit 170 miles per hour on the Le Mans famous Mousa- Moulin Strait, and after a fighting second place finish in 1954, it would go on to win the 24 hours in three occasions, 1955, 56 and 57, as well as dominating other great endurance races, such as the Reims 12 hours. Towards the end of the 1950s, Jaguar's road and race engine departments began to converge, working on a future production car powered by the XK engine that would be show-stopping even by the high standards set by Jaguar over the previous decade. All of Jaguar's Le Mans winners had, of course, been powered by XK engines, and these successes established Jaguar not just as a maker of world-beating sports cars, but one who translated what was learned in racing into improving the breed. Enter the E-Type. For the XK engine, which had performed so incredibly on the track, was at the heart of every road-going model too, and as the creative juices of the design department were distilled with the engineering know-how of the race team, it became clear that the next stage of Jaguar's sports car evolution would bring something very special indeed. And after the glory days of the C-Type and D-Type, it almost named itself. 1961-1974, to E-Type. In 1957, a terrible fire swept through Jaguar's Browns Lane factory, destroying the production line and bringing to a halt plans to create a car that had Jaguar's Le Mans winners as its generic heritage. The fire halted the XKSS project and subsequently Jaguar's sports car ambitions for several years. But the marked reputation as a race car winner would not fade and would become catalyst for its most successful car ever, the E-Type. Through the 1950s, the XK engine had powered race cars, evolved thanks to special camshafts, bigger valves, and carburetors, and eventually fuel injection. As powers rose through 250 to 270, and ultimately 300 brake horsepower, cars like the D-Type would reach unrivaled speeds, and yet were still quite usable on the road, if you could live without thrills. The XKSS was meant to be the car that would offer the best of both worlds, but for the fire of 1957. What came next, however, while race bread, was only equivocally meant for the road. E-Type, a style icon. With his XK engine, the E-Type promised the performance of a true exotic, 
at a price that again underlined Jaguar's value for money reputation. With its comp- contemporary, the Mini, it totally captured the mood of the moment in what soon became the swinging 60s. Like the Mini, it was proudly British and oddly classless. Away from any other pro sports car that could get remotely close to its legendary performance. What set it apart from anything, of course, as well as its looks. What set it apart, p- apart from anything, was of course its looks. And if you don't have to know anything about engineering or care anything about ultimate performance to recognise those, the E-Type was simply one of those most recognised cars The E-Type was simply one of those most recognisable cars in the world and there was real aerodynamic substance to that achingly beautiful shape. Again, like the Mini, the E-Type was a car that the non-car lover loved, a car that defined its era. By the late 1950s, Jaguar had stopped racing, but the XK remained the engine of choice for for race car builders like Cooper, Tejero and Lister. And then in 1960, American Briggs Cunningham borrowed an experimental car from Jaguar to race at Le Mans. Powered by a 3-litre XK6, Cunningham's E2A would move Jaguar road car technology on by echoing the D-type central monocoque and front space frame while incorporating Jaguar's first independent rear suspension on another subframe. Sayer had also given the E2A a longer, sleeker version of D-Type's iconic low-drag body. At the Geneva Motor Show in 1961, the race car had evolved into a, the spectacular shape of the E-Type fixed-head coupe, described by no less than critic Enzo Ferrari as the most beautiful car ever made. His stunning looks had a feline sleekness and a luxurious cabin clearly made this a genuine road car, not a racer with a number plate. It promised 150 miles per hour performance, world leading ride and handling and a price that would make any thoroughbred with similar ability look massively overinflated. In fact, there were few other sports cars in 1961 that could match his performance at any price. To describe it as a pivotal moment in motoring history would be an understatement. The 3.8 litre E-Type grabbed headlines around the world and the whole world wanted it. But there was more to come. Hot on the heels of the coupe came the roaster and impossible though it seemed, the roaster was even more glamorous, more racy, more utterly right. In racing, the lightweight E-Type could challenge all comers and the production E-Type evolved just as the XKs had. In 1964, the first 4.2 litre coupe and roaster brought more flexibility. An all synchro mesh gearbox and stronger rear inboard discs. The E-Type's comfort and refinement were much a part of the legend as its performance and all still centred around the superb XK6. The 2 plus 2 added a little young family practicality in 1966 and the Series 2 evolution took the trio to 1970 with ever more comfort and refinement plus whatever it needed to meet the increasingly demanding American legislations before the cylinder count doubled and the arrival of the Series 3 V12 in 1971. Jaguar the company changed hugely between the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 1990s, but its commitment to stylish luxury, luxurious cars with outstanding driving dynamics never wavered. For much of, the t- of that time, the XK engine still had its part in history. Finally, though, it had run its course, and for a while there was no XK, XK-badged engine in the Jaguar range on either car or engines. But when it returned in 1996, it did so on one of Jaguar's most most successful sports cars ever, with the XK character fully intact as the XK8. That generation introduced glorious new looks, one of the lightest and most efficient V8 engines in the world, in naturally aspirated form, and the potent 
supercharged version of the first XKR, the XK modern era. In 1996, XK also introduced a catalogue of new technologies that reflected Jaguar as one of the most forward-thinking manufacturers in the industry. And the class of 2006, the next generous Generation XK and Supercharged XKR took the whole philosophy a stage further with lightweight all aluminium construction and the first sight of Jaguar's all new design language for the future. This is XK with a 21st century focus and it's still moving on with new special edition versions, car that echo the legendary performance of its predecessors. 1996 to 2008 the XK8 to XKR. When the end finally came for the XK engine, it, it came because the world had changed even more than the engine had, despite its continuous evolution. But it is a testament to the brilliance of the original design that it has survived into the mid-1980s in the 3.4 and 4.2 forms. In 1985, the 600 advanced AJ6 engine was introduced and the faithful XK was finally retired. But as the engine that had shaped Jaguar, it was never forgotten, nor was the XK badge, for in 1996 it reappeared on a stunning all-new Jaguar sports car that brought XK firmly into the modern era in the form of the first XK8. Developed by a team led by Jaguar's respected director of design, Jeff Lawson, it was the epitome of, of modern Jaguar and reflected the times into which it was born. While unashamedly evoking the spirit of the E-Time, he was far more a grand, a luxury grand tourer than, a, than an old-school no frill sports car in the 1950s and 60s XK mould. But with its sleek looks, intelligent use of new technologies, an unwavering driver focus, it was every inch a sporting Jaguar. In fact, the first XK was destined to become the fastest selling sports car in Jaguar's history to that point. Powered by Jaguar's all new 4 cam 32 valve 4.2 litre AJ V8 engine, it was also one of the best. Quicker, more refined, and more efficient than any XK before it, yet still with the purest of Jaguar DNA. In 1998, the range took another leap forward with the advent of supercharged power in the form of the devastatingly fast XKR. The technology continued to be a byword of the XK development. By 2001, it had Jaguar's adaptive restraint technology system and by 2003, it, it introduced a 4.2 litre version of the acclaimed V8 with 300 bhp plus emergency brake assist, dynamic stability control and class-leading six-speed automatic transmission, widely recognised as the best in the industry. Even more spectacular, the new supercharged version gave 400 bhp, an effortless p performance that Jaguar's old Le Mans, Le Mans winners could only have dreamed of, but still with the luxury of refinement and choice of coupe and convertible shapes that mark that the market loved. In 2004, styling changes and even more equipment kept the XK f fresh, but, an but another new generation was ready to make its mark. Like the very first XK, the 120, the new 2006 XK and XKR rewrote the rule books. Clearly the most advanced XK ever, the new car was designed and engineered, engineered around Jaguar's new lightweight vehicle architecture technologies pioneered in the XK in the XJ saloon. The industry leading bonded and riveted all aluminium construction made the monocoque shell some 180 kilos lighter and 90% stiffer than key rivals, meaning better performance, better economy, better braking and handling, better refinement. At the heart of the car was Jaguar's AJ V8 engine with supercharged and nat natural aspirated forms. The 4.2 litre supercharged XKR now had a 420 horsepower, giving it sprinting performance from standstill to 60 in just 4.9 seconds. 
Combined with excellence at high speed, this made the XKR a class-leading sporting Grand Tourer with a real performance edge. Just as importantly, the X, the 2006 XK also revealed a new design language for Jaguar. Conceived by Director of Design Ian Callum, it first introduced a fresh simplicity and purity, a pure dynamic beauty. The 2008 XK sports cars take the XK lineage up to the new heights. The XKR is Jaguar's sporting flagship in a modern era and the standard bearer for the Mark's R performance credentials. Limited editions like the 174mph XKRS give the owners the chance to have something even more alluring and they seize the opportunity. For many people, the XK sports car through its ages represents what makes Jaguar so special. And if the first 60 years of XK have been memorable, thrilling journey, just think what the future could hold. XK Generations, 1948-2008 to 2008. From swooping XK120s to the mus- muscular brooding XKRS, Jaguar's definitive sports car range has evolved across six decades, with every model a collector's dream. This is the closest thing we will ever create to something that's alive. Sir William Lyons. So there you go, that's the brochure. Um, if you're interested in any other brochures like this and the XK8, I've got a selection of them on our website, www.modriol.co.uk. Um, so if you want to read through this at your leisure, there's a PDF version of the, of the brochure there. Plus you'll find any uh, manuals and uh, uh, electrical diagrams, um, spec sheets, everything about that. Anything about XK related is on the website anyway. It's a bit of a database we're building up. Anyway, if you like this sort of video, please like, comment, share and subscribe for more XK videos. Bye-bye.